We must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey, and thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, as we greatly appreciate your support to help us advance healthcare education. We are very happy to announce that we have created a new tool to help develop clinicians into better experts. With that being said, we have created the HET Light Tool, which LIGHT stands for Learning, integrated towards expertise. And what we've done is we've taken our first year's worth of episodes with experts in the fields of healthcare and education, and we've taken one golden nugget or theory on expertise and presented it to you in a very easily consumable format so that people can take one lesson or nugget per week and map out and plan how to incorporate it into your clinical and educational practices. And by the end of the year, we think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how far you've progressed towards becoming an expert. Thank you again all for your continued support. And now for the show. Hello, everybody. I am F. Scott Field, and as always, I'm here with my co-host, Brandon Pone. We are so thrilled to have on the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast today, Dr. Danny Matei. Dr. Danny Matei is a coach, physical therapist, educator, and founder of Athletes Potential. He's considered a world-renowned leader in the fields of rehab, sports medicine, and especially tactical athlete consulting and human performance optimization. He's also a fellow podcaster hosting the PT Entrepreneur Podcast and the Doc and Jock Podcast. As founder of Athletes Potential, a physical therapy and performance optimization practice in Atlanta, Georgia, he's also one of only eight instructors in the world for Mobility Wad Group, founded by Dr. Kelly Sturette who subsequently will also be a guest on the show pretty soon. Dan received his doctorate of physical therapy from Baylor University. He's board-certified orthopedic clinical specialist, certified strength and conditioning specialist. Danny also spent seven years active duty in the U.S. Army as a physical therapist. He had the distinct privilege of working with a range of soldiers from amputees learning how to walk again to the highest level special ops soldiers getting ready for deployments. Danny served with the 25th Infantry Division at Schofield Barracks, Hawaii from 2010 to 2013. He was the only direct access physical therapist responsible for management of injuries and injury prevention for a brigade brigade of 4,000 soldiers during this time. Danny's been an instructor in a variety of different settings, from local consulting with CrossFit gyms and athletes to international teaching as an instructor for Mobility Wad. He most recently took over as the director of Mobility Wad Tactical and is a direct consultant to numerous tactical organizations, such as the FBI, SWAT, U.S. Army, and Combined Arms Group. Danny, first off, man, thank you so much for your service to our country, and thanks for coming on the show tonight. Um, you know, I know we kept your bio relatively brief, but is there anything else you'd like our audience to know about you that we didn't mention in the intro? So I think that was a pretty legit bio. My wife must have written that because um, it makes me sound a lot cooler than I am. Uh, so, you know, the, <laughs> no, it's, 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 been, uh, it's been really... Um, you know, my, my career so far is, you know, it's relatively young and it's been fun to have had an opportunity to be exposed to, uh, you know, a lot of different settings and uh, in particular the military, you know, that's, that's been an area that I just think that PTs serve a really unique purpose there. Like we talk about this idea of, Hey, we want to have direct access in every state. I mean, you're, you're talking about an organization that's had that since the seventies. Uh, and uh, you know, the roles that you can fulfill as a PT in the military are really, um, unique in in many ways. So, uh, so that that was something. I, you know, I'm definitely really uh, fortunate that I was had the ability to to serve in, in the military, but also in the role of uh, of being a medical provider as well. Yeah, no, and we're so excited to kind of hear more about this perspective to how to really kind of connect with and teach and you know and talk with these folks. You know, and Danny, first before we kind of get to a little bit of that topic. Do you think you could tell us a little bit about kind of your academic journey and how it led to where you are today? Because I feel like your journey is a little different than many of our audience may be used to having gone through Baylor's Army DPT program. Sure. Yeah. So so my my journey, at least to get to school in particular, is probably very similar to many other people where, you know, I had a uh, knee injury playing football when I was in high school. I had, had to have surgery um, that after that season and, um, and then went through physical therapy. And, you know, I remember going to physical therapy and not doing the exercises that I was told to do. And then coming back and the, the guy that I had, that was PT, this is in Augusta, Georgia. Um, he, he made me do, um, 
uh, assault bike uh, sprints until I puked. And I thought to myself, I was like, this is pretty awesome because he came up to me while I was yakking and he was like, are you going to do your homework? And, uh, and I said, I was like, this is great. You can do this for a living. People pay you. So I, I thought, you know, at this, at 16, I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. And, uh, my dad was, um, active duty. So he's retired, uh, army, uh, uh, as well. And so, uh, you know, it was sort of natural for me to think about going that direction when I found out about the Baylor program, which is just like probably the army's greatest secret, you know, and it's just such a cool program. And the, uh, you know, I, I know it, it is at this point, I think it's probably a little more well-known, um, you know, and uh, maybe a little more challenging to get into, but I was fortunate enough to get into it. And, uh, uh, so I went from, you know, undergrad straight into, into this, um, doctoral program and it's sort of, it's, it's, it is accelerated. They spent a lot of time in, um, clinical rotations and I decided, you know, we had opportunity to, to, to do clinicals for a year and you, you, you had a say over where you wanted to go. And, uh, I think you guys might, I, I, I almost positive. Do you guys have Andrew Bennett on this podcast already? Yes. Just for you. Okay. So Yep, we did. Perfect. All right. Mm -hmm. I thought so. So big shout out to Andrew Bennett. He's, uh, he was my clinical instructor for the year that, um, that I, I chose to do this, this rotation and I picked New Braunfels, Texas, um, specifically based on a recommendation from, uh, an instructor we had, Deidre Tahan, who said of all the people that we could go and work with from a manual therapy standpoint, um, Andrew's probably the best instructor and I would definitely, I would definitely agree with that. The other thing about Andrew, I don't know how much you guys got into this through the podcast, I have to go back and listen to it, is he's also a very savvy businessman. And, um, you know, I was fortunate that he gave me like books, business books while I was uh, in this residency uh, or internship for a year that he thought would improve my um, my skill set and was was a very blunt uh, uh, instructor when it came to constructive uh, feedback, which was fine with me. I respond pretty well, pretty well to that. So, uh, you know, so I, I think I, he sort of planted a seed in me of maybe other things outside of the military early on. Um, I have a little interest in that. And then I went on to serve, you know, four and a half years, um, in, in the military in a couple of different roles, mainly, uh, you know, working with soldiers directly and a lot of human performance work as well, which was, which is really neat to be able to do a little bit of a, a couple of different things. And, and, um, in, in Hawaii, that's where I ended up getting linked up with the mobility wide group when I was stationed out there and, um, and, you know, uh, was offered the opportunity to come on to the mobility wide team and, uh, and primarily to really work with a lot of the, uh, tactical contracts that we kept getting, um, offers for where, you know, come in and work with this group or this group of medics. And, uh, Kelly, I think f felt that I had a skill set that would transfer to, uh, you know, being able to work with those groups and have a little bit more, um, I, I have an idea of how to speak their language and, and what those guys are looking for and unique problems to deal with. So, um, decided to get out and open a, uh, practice athletes potential in Atlanta in, uh, 2014 and take that role with mobility wad and, uh, and really try to try to grow a practice here where we were really working with people the way I felt PT should be able to work with folks one-on-one -on -one and really use our skill set. Um, and then traveling, you know, at this point internationally with mobility wad to really handle a lot of the tactical work and, and civilian consulting as well. But, um, yeah, that's sort of the, and I guess the, the, the road that I've taken to where we are now. And, uh, I mean, I really think that a lot of the decisions I made were, uh, I'm very fortunate that I got to be around some of the smarter people that I've ever worked with in particular while I was in the military. Yeah, Danny, that's an amazing story, man. I love that journey. Um, well, let's jump right into things and, and kind of dive into the specifics of today's show. But, you know, it's the tactical athlete or the tactical patient. Could you kind of define for our audience what the tactical athlete or the the tactical avatar looks like? Yeah, I think it's a tough, it's a tough nut to crack, man. I mean, cause you got to say like, oh, okay. So if, if we're talking sports specificity, um, you know, if we're talking football players, right? Like, so we work with some, uh, some high level football players here in Atlanta and we know that they are, they are, a, that's an upright sport for the most part, right? Now they're going to hit the ground and they've got to be able to roll and things, but you know, when they make contact or where they're changing direction, they're primarily, um, upright, uh, in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, we, we know what they need to be good at. We know, we know what they're domains of movement are and, and what that game looks 
looks like. And for a tactical athlete, you don't really have that because they sort of have to be able to do a little bit of everything, which which makes it uh, really challenging. I, I had a conversation once with uh, a strength coach that was trying to you know lump them into a sport as best he could, and he felt lacrosse was the best fit because you know they're carrying something um, in front of them. They have to be strong. They have to be uh, anaerobically conditioned, but also aerobically aer- aerobically conditioned and coordinated and have accuracy. And I feel like that maybe was the best representation. But then you know lacrosse players don't wear. 60 pounds of gear, uh, and then be in austere conditions while they do their job. So you have to take these other stressors into what's going on. So, um, it's a very, very challenging group to work with. And we know across the board, there's almost a million non-combat related musculoskeletal injuries per year in the DOD. So that's across the department of defense, which is billions and billions of dollars in healthcare costs, but also, you know, days lost at, uh, at work as well. And, and potentially even discharged from the military for medical purposes. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it is a challenging group to work with. And I think that the area that we found the most success with, and this is really sort of just, you know, uh, mobility wad 101 is the idea that these guys really have no idea how to take care of their own body. And, you know, that has to be an emphasis because they move a lot. They, they don't know where they're going to be in some cases, medical resources are slim. And, uh, you know, if, if they understand how to manage some basic things, uh, that are going to pop up in themselves, then, you know, we can really multiply that uh, effect of medics and, and healthcare providers versus being very reactive. We can be very proactive and teach them how to, uh, you know, manage some of these issues before their problem. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good take, Danny. And I think just to kind of get some clarification here, kind of, so, you know, in your opinion, what are some of the differences you find that you come across with educating the tactical athlete from, say, an everyday fitness-based individual? Okay. So it, it depends, right? So tactical, I guess you could lump a lot of things into that. So it could be active you know, military, it could be law enforcement, it could be firefighters. And most of my experience is with um, active duty military. And I, you know, not, not to sound... Uh, negative in any way. This is just the way it is. Not everybody that joins the the military is what you think of with the military. Like not everybody is Pat Tillman, you know, and uh, when I joined, I was like, oh man, everybody's going to be super fit and motivated and they're just going to want to train and they're all going to be a bunch of badass American heroes. But the reality is the military as a whole, in many cases is a fairly unhealthy group of, um, uh, individuals compared to what you might think it is. Now, t- based on the general population, it's probably a lot more physically active because they have to train, you know, five days a week. But there's definitely issues with weight management and you know physical training, and uh, in, in in you have to keep that in mind. Not only that, on average, you're dealing with like 20 year old buttheads. So so. Th- what they want to do is play Halo all night and drink Monster Energy drinks and eat, you know, honey buns for for breakfast. And that's not necessarily something that leads to high level performance, right? So when we work with the c- conventional military groups, you know, it's it's not necessarily going to be the level of knowledge that you would think. Now, when we get a chance to work with some of these special operations groups, these guys are 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 fucking insane, and they're and they're squared away, right? And they they care about their body. They have an older um, average age, they have a very high knowledge level and how to take care of themselves. And they're very much interested in how they can maintain their body for longer. So, you know, some of the challenges are buy-in, right? The idea of how do you convince a soldier that's 20 years old, that thinks he's bulletproof, that he needs to be doing some of these things from a preventative standpoint. And that is very challenging. And what we've found is typically they respond best to things that will cause them uh, to have increased performance, right? So um, this is really across the board with any uh, patient that you might have, but you have to figure out like what motivates that person. And if you can find that internal trigger of what that motivation is for that for that person, then you can typically make a stronger connection with them and get better buy-in and also have a better, um, uh, they, they will think that you have the right solution for them, which which honestly is half the battle. So for us, what we found is, you know, if I took, if I used to go in and like, this is when I was at my brigade, I realized this really quickly. If I went in and I did an injury prevention class about how to, you know, not get shin splints or anterior knee pain when you run, nobody really pay attention. It was very, 
you know, poorly received. But if I did an injury prevention uh, program, but I said, this is a running performance clinic where I'm going to teach you how to cut a minute off of your two mile time. So you're going to get better PT scores and you'll get promoted better. Now, all of a sudden I've got your attention, but they're one in the same. If you're an efficient runner, you're not going to get hurt, but you're also going to be faster. So, you know, this is something that uh, I, I think you just had to frame it correctly. And performance tends to drive change in a lot of these groups. Yeah, Danny, that, that's a great point. It's really just how you package it, I think. And that goes, you know, I think for the tactical athlete as well as uh, normal everyday patients too, for sure. Um, I kind of want to ask a hybrid question here that, that kind of involves some of your entrepreneurial background, but some of the tactical athlete stuff too. How important was building and utilizing your network in getting into a niche such as tactical athlete training and education? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it was everything, right? But I, uh, my relationship development with Kelly Starrett, who offered me this, you know, opportunity, was really built from me wanting to progress as a physical therapist, you know, and, and I had no desire whatsoever to get out of the army. If you'd asked me, you know, in two thousand thirteen, at the beginning of two thousand thirteen, I would have told you, you know, I was going to be in it for a career, and and that was that was the assumption I had when I went to the, to the Baylor program in many ways, you know, I thought maybe, you know, I'll do my career and then I'll get out and maybe I'll open a practice or something like that. But, uh, it, you know, when he, when he reached out to me and, th- and gauged my interest in it, he said something to me that was really interesting where he said, you know, I feel like you can help the military more from the outside than being in it. And, and it makes a lot of sense because, uh, in, in the military, you're, you're seen as, your rank, right? So I'm Captain Mate when I show up to whatever. Whatever I have to say, it, it doesn't really matter because I'm Captain Mate. And if Major whoever or Lieutenant Colonel whoever or General whoever um, disagrees with me or thinks there's a better way, then that is the direction that we're going to go. And it can be a bit of a frustrating group to work in. So, you know, when he, when he pitched it to me that way, it made actually a lot of sense because now I could come in as in more of a consultant role and be able to have my message taken differently. And what's funny is, you know, I can, t- I, I can tell you, like, I still have a lot of connections in the military because I, I know a lot of people that are still active duty. And, um, I taught recently up at Fort Bragg for the, uh, for the airborne Corps up there, which is, you know, basically, um, uh, is in charge of about 90,000, uh, soldiers in the, uh, in the army. And the, uh, commander of that is, was actually the first, uh, divisional commander, uh, or deputy commander, I should say of the division that, that I was at. And, um, this guy wanted nothing to do with me whenever I first showed up because as a physical therapist showing up in an infantry brigade, they don't know what the hell you are. And they do want to know why they're having to give up an officer slot for a physical therapist. So it was sort of a tough, um, position to put yourself in. This guy just so happens to have hurt himself uh, running. So I got to see him for a knee issue. F- you know, we're able to resolve that. Not only that, but help him run faster. And then from there, pretty much whatever I said was was a was a go. We could do whatever I wanted. Well, this guy. Um, he's now the commander of this division. So I show up and he shows up to give me a coin, which is typical. Typically when you do a job and a military, they'll give you a coin that represents their, you know, whatever, with the group that you worked with. So he shows up and he sees me standing there and he's like, wait a second, I know you, you know? And, and I'm like, yes, sir. I remember you, you know, he's a two-star general now. And, but if I had shown up as Captain Mate, I never would have gotten in front of this entire group of 90,000, you know, people that are decision makers. But if me showing up as a consultant for an outside group, now I get to represent uh, my views and be are taken completely different. So I'm not Captain Mate, you know, I show up and I'm just, I'm Danny. I work for this group and, and this is what I have to say, take it or leave it. Um, but it's totally different in terms of the ability to make uh, decisions and, and relay information without rank necessarily blurring the line. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important message for our listeners to hear in terms of how really how one simple little change in different position with being a consultant can really have some real reap some really huge gains um, without having to go sort of this tra- a traditional route. So I think that's a really important um, point to hear. And, you know, Danny, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and kind of ask a follow up question to kind of what you alluded to sort of at the beginning here in which you kind of talked about the Baylor Army program and kind of how it was a big secret overall. Yeah. And, you know, something that I'd kind of like just to kind of get some clarification on and for perhaps our audience who isn't aware, do you think you kind of give us kind of a background of kind of how that program structured and kind of how it's different from kind of the mainstream DPT program that you were commonly heard about? Sure. So the Baylor program is um, 
It's uh, the U.S. Army Baylor uh, PT program, which is in San Antonio, Texas. There's Baylor faculty, but half your faculty is active duty, um, typically lieutenant colonels and colonels that have their Ph.D. in neuroscience or, or, you know, whatever their subspecialty is, biomechanics, you know, whatever it is. And uh, uh, so it's it's run half through civilian faculty, half through active duty faculty, but you get commissioned as an officer in the army. You go through officer basic course, which is a training program, just sort of like watered down basic training, but primarily for medical officers. And uh, you show up in, I guess it was show up in like August and you do training until through the end of the year and you start school in January. Uh, the didactic portion is condensed and then you end up sp- spending about 14 months in clinical rotations. But uh, for us, it was one eight-week clinical rotation and then a, a basically a 12-month rotation where they just, what they want is when you graduate that you're able to um, assume a role in a clinic or on your own and be sufficient. And what they don't want is this learning period where you gr- you graduate and then you have to figure out how to be a physical therapist and functional. Uh, they wanted it to just be, you rolled out of school and you were ready to go uh, because you could be going you know, to any number of places and be isolated. You may be the only medical provider, only physical therapist um, there. So the other unique thing about this program is, um, the number one, the government pays for your education. So I had no um, graduate student loans from, from uh, you know, the PT program. The other thing is you're commissioned as an officer. So you actually get paid to go to school, which is um, when, I, when I first looked at this program, I was like, this can't be right. You know, like this, there's gotta be something there has to be something wrong. Like, what's the catch? Because I was thinking, well, going in the army would be cool. I was thinking about doing it anyway. And now I get to go to like a top five program. This would be awesome. And then they're going to pay me to go to school and I don't have any student loans. Like, man, what a freaking sweet deal, you know? And and it really is. And if you have aspirations to go into the military, like it is an absolute no brainer uh, for you to go this direction. Um, and the other thing is heavily manual therapy and orthopedics um, based. Like I had no interest in pediatrics or geriatrics or anything outside of working with um, this type of population. And that's what you learn. So if you are interested more in like the neuro side of things or inpatient, um, it is not probably the best place for you to go because you're just going to get heavy doses of how to use your hands, how to work with sports related injuries um, and progress those to getting back to, you know, functional enough to, to fight. Yeah. Danny, you bring up a good point. What, what are some other opportunities um, once you graduate from that program that, that you could get into? So, so there's actually quite a few. Um, they have some um, like DSC programs uh, where uh, you know you can get secondary doctoral degrees um, from like West Point in sports medicine. So that's a, I believe that's a twelve to eighteen, twelve or eighteen month program where you actually get assigned to West Point and you work with their sports medicine teams and you do some research up there. Um, you can do that. You can uh, apply to get a PhD if you'd like to do that. So they, there's called long term health education. So if you apply and it depends on the year which which types of PhDs they're um, going to pay for, but the the military will send you um, back to school for I think it's a three three year deal where you're basically a civilian for three years going to school. And, uh, you know, my, my faculty uh, mentor at Baylor, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer, he told me a funny story about when he was at um, – I think it's at Kentucky, uh, where is where he went and did his uh, PhD in neuroscience. And uh, when he told his neighbor, he met his neighbor and they're having him for like a barbecue and and uh, they were drinking a beer and he was asking him what he does, you know, and he's like, oh, I'm a student, you know, and and the guy was wondering like, well, how do you pay for this house? You know, because it's like in a nice area and he's got kids and, you know, and he's like, well, the army pays me to go to school. He's like, they do what? Like he couldn't fathom that somebody would get paid to go to get a PhD and, and not have any loans. So, and that's an option that you have now. Now there's a catch, right? The army always, if they're going to do something for you, like they, you owe them time. So, so that's how they, you know, it, they, they tend to try to keep people that are good providers, you know, in, and, and they want to incentivize them to do that. So if you want to go do a PhD program, cool, they'll pay for you to go and they'll pay you while you're in school, but um, you owe them X amount of years afterward to, to pay that off. You know, so, so there's definitely some things like that. Yeah, I know that's really helpful to kind of hear, especially to give some perspective for perhaps maybe a pre-PT who's looking to kind of find what's a good school for them kind of based on some of those benefits, because I think that's really important to know. And, you know, Danny, kind of to kind of, kind of fast forward a little bit now. So we're saying individuals kind of gone through the program and 
or just any program in general, and they're looking to start treating maybe a population or a clinic or a setting that treats more people that are that we consider tactical athletes or those with perhaps more military background. What are what are some of the biggest tips or pieces of advice that you would give to a young clinician just starting out that may be interested in helping to train and treat these individuals? Yeah. So I, the the I would say the number one thing that I learned being in this tactical environment as an active duty um, officer was the fact that you 100% have to lead from the front. You cannot go out and tell people to do one thing. And if they see you do something differently, they, you're just going to get ripped apart. Like if, if I told somebody like, look, man, like you're barely making your tape test, meaning you're, you're too heavy for your height. And that means that the, the army may potentially kick you out because of this. If you don't start to meet these health standards, you know, put down the, the, the freaking you know, uh, Danish in the morning, don't do it, man. And, and yet if I go into the, the mess hall and, and I'm, I'm, I'm eating breakfast and I'm chowing down on a bunch of Danishes and that guy walks by me, you know, He's going to be like, oh, what the fuck, sir? You just told me not to eat this. <laughs> like, why, why are you doing that? You know, and, or if I tell somebody, hey, you know, you need to be doing, you know, training. This is what it should look like and prioritize your physical fitness, you know, and, and yet I'm not actually in shape myself. That's a really hard sell to somebody. So I think you have to lead from the front. You have to show people that you're willing to, um, you know, t- to not be hypocritical. And that is the number one way that I've found to get, uh, to get buy-in with this type of community, because it's very similar to like uh, a team environment, right? Like it's sort of hard to break into groups like that if you're not one of them. And, uh, you know, if, if you definitely don't look the part or you're not, you don't act the part or you're hypocritical, they will not listen to a thing you have to say. Yeah, Danny, I think that's a really good piece of advice. And, you know, something that I just really kind of want to get your opinion on, because this is something that I want to kind of poll some of my friends that have served to kind of see what their opinions are. I've kind of gotten some mixed responses. So I'm really kind of curious to hear what your thoughts on this next question is. But, you know, how important is it that that provider, whoever they're working with, also has any sort of military background? Like, is that something that you feel is absolutely essential for buy-in to listen? Or does that depend on the person? Or, you know, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. I think it helps. I mean, like I had no, um, I, I had no prior service experience, uh, whenever I joined. Right. So I was direct commission. Um, I have friends that were, uh, you know, infantry, they were enlisted in the infantry that were in the program with me. You know, we had people that were in the special forces that went back to PT school. They were in the Ranger regiment that went back to PT school. If, if, if that is, if that is what somebody does, it's almost like a, unfair advantage in terms of getting buy-in with soldiers. Like if you show up and I mean, you wear your, the schools that you've gone to on your uniform. So, you know, imagine if you're a 19 year old soldier and your physical therapist walks in and he has a special forces tab, you know, the way that you perceive that, like that's a rare thing to see uh, in in many communities. And that means you've done some hard stuff and that you've been in some elite groups. So if you walk in with something like that, I mean, dude, you could tell them that do whatever you want it and they'll do it in, in that, in that community. Now, is it necessary? Not, I don't think so. You know, I, I definitely was able to, to have success in that community without uh, a previous history of, of being in the military, but it is very helpful though. I would say it's very helpful from a standpoint of, um, knowing, uh, how to act. There's a lot of sort of like, um, unwritten rules in the military and, it's hard to learn on the fly. Like you're, you're learning how to be a medical provider. They barely teach you how to be an officer in the military. But when you get to some of these group settings, they don't know that, right? So you just walk around and you have a, you, you have your rank on and they just assume that you're, you're an infantry officer or whatever it might be, artillery, and you're a physical therapist, you know? So if you're walking on the wrong side of uh, somebody that has a higher rank than you, they're going to wonder why, you know, you better have your uniform squared away. Otherwise they're going to think that you look like an absolute slob and they're, you know, it's going to show up really easily. So some of these little things, if your prior service are just no brainers and you do them habitually. Um, so these are things you just have to learn, which is a little bit more challenging because you're also just trying to figure out how to do your job. Yeah, that's, that's amazing, Danny. That's actually a, a really interesting point. Um, and speaking of that, what, how would you say that your experiences in the U S army and working with the tactical athlete have kind of spilled over? over into your business and entrepreneurial side of things? Well, uh, it's, I think it's been very helpful. So uh, well, a couple of things happen whenever you join the military. So number one, you know, you get, you get leadership roles thrust upon you 
uh, way earlier than you think you should, or maybe you could potentially handle them, you know, and it's just because in some cases, and this is the next man up, right? Like my, my boss, my first boss, when I was in, um, uh, in Schofield barracks, she, uh, sh- she was, you know, pregnant and, um, she had like very early labor, uh, very unexpected. And I, I was the only other, um, uh, officer at the time in that clinic. And she was in charge of three clinics and it was a total of about 35 people, um, or 25 people that she was in charge of. And, uh, before I knew it, uh, she, we hadn't trained me on anything because we thought we had time. And she ends up with, you know, being on bed rest in the hospital. And next thing I know, the next day I show up and I'm the director of all these clinics at the staff meeting, sitting with a bunch of colonels and have no idea what the hell I'm doing. Uh, so uh, sometimes you get leadership roles thrown at you before you think you're ready and you end up having to learn things very quickly and uh, I- improvise in some cases and, and just figure things out. And they, they put a lot of uh, you know, they, they put a lot of uh, emphasis on you being able to do that. So um, business is no different, man. Like, dude, business is a roller coaster. And if, if you, you know, you may be having a great week, great month, something like that. And the next thing you know, something negative happens, but your your ability to um, stay level headed and adjust and lead people um, when you learn how to do that from a very early stage in your career because you had to is very helpful. And I don't know if you can learn that from reading a book. I don't know. I don't think you can learn that from a class in school. I think it is a thing. It's something you have to struggle with and you have to gain confidence in in your ability to do that. And that is one thing for better or worse, the military will shove you into leadership positions and expect that you figure it out. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important message to hear for our audience to hear, especially it kind of reminds me of the quote, you know, without struggle, there is no strength. So I think that's a really, really important point. And, you know, Danny, I'm going to back up a little bit and realize I probably should have asked this question more in the beginning, but uh, I kind of just thought about this now. So, you know, as a clinician right now, I, I don't see a very high percentage of people um, that have military service, but I do from time to time. And, you know, an issue that I commonly come across in general is, and I realize this next question could open up a lot of discussion here and I'm not trying to go, not trying to open up Pandora's box here, but something that I think is really important to discuss is kind of really dealing with kind of the after effects of, you know, a conflict, and especially the PTSD. And for someone who perhaps hasn't been in that experience exactly, and it was maybe working with an individual, whether it be a, a client or even a family member for that matter, who has yeah. experiencing that, you know, in your opinion, what's kind of the best way to go about that to help that individual? And that's tough, man. You know, I, I can definitely see that that's a, that's a challenge for anybody to deal with. I mean, a lot of it has to do with the fact that you have to understand, like sometimes the, the uh, personality changes that develop, like a lot of times people that are dealing with uh, post-traumatic, you know, stress issues, they tend to be uh, fairly short with people, um, agitated, easier. This happened to my my brother. I remember I was in the Baylor program when, uh, you know, my, my brother got back from Baghdad and he's a uh, emergency medicine and he was, was there for 15 months and just saw just like really, really incredible amount of trauma. And not only that, but like, I mean, it's a dangerous place. So your stress levels are higher and, and, um, you know, things happen where even if you're in a, a hospital or a, a bigger, um, base, like you're still getting, rocketed and mortared. And, and so you're constantly in this high, high level of, of, uh, stress state. And I remember when Sam came back, you know, we went out to this, uh, Brazilian steakhouse because, you know, he was like, I've been eating shitty food for over a year. Like, let's go somewhere good. And, you know, he, he was stationed in El Paso. So he flew back to El Paso and then flew into San Antonio. And I saw him probably within less than a week, whenever he got back, so we're taking this Brazilian steakhouse and, you know, he orders a drink and, uh, the waiter just got the, had the wrong drink and under normal circumstances, he's not somebody to just like lash out at a, uh, a waiter or a waitress. And he just like, you know, berated this guy about not, not getting him the right, the right drink. And I was like, dude, what the hell's wrong with you? You know? And, and I didn't realize that he had been affected that much. And, and it's something that definitely affects his personality. And I would say probably for a good solid year, it was like that. And, and, you know, if you have somebody that you're working with, that's like that, I think you have to just be very aware of the fact that the, 
they may have done things or seen things that you haven't. And also they may also be slightly irritated that they had to do that, those things and you didn't. And, uh, and it depends how, how they're working through it. I mean, if it's really bad, I would recommend that they go and, you know, talk to somebody and get some help. And there's plenty of places they can do that, that are resources for the military. But, um, I think you have to be really patient with those people and you have to really understand where they're coming from and try to have perspective on that. But it's very hard to have perspective on that if, you know, you haven't necessarily, um, had to deal with those things yourself. So it is challenged, man. I, you know, it's, uh, I don't know the really the best way to answer that. No, I appreciate that that response because I think that's overall still very helpful. And I think that's definitely something that I'll keep in mind. And I hope our audience will as well, especially if they ever encounter an individual, perhaps that's going through that to kind of at least help them point them in the right direction, at least. Because even if we haven't had that kind of, you know, um, point of view or that experience, I mean, at least if we can at least, you know, treat them right with good care, understand where they're coming from. And when that individual feels ready, if they're, and if they're open, kind of pointing them in direction of further resources, if that's something that perhaps the clinician using judgment is needed and assuming that the patient is open with that. So I think, I think overall, that's a really good take. And, you know, and Danny, of course, being a fellow podcaster, we would, we would be remiss if we didn't ask this question, but you know, how helpful do you feel that your podcasts have been and how have you tried to utilize them to progress your career and your business? Well, I think they've been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, we started the Doc and Jock podcast. My co-host uh, Joe Shimonic and I did. Uh, um, it, it would have been about three years ago. We actually uh, recently, beginning of this year, decided to um, put that project on hold, and primarily because the the three of us, Johnny, uh, who is our podcast producer, Joe, and myself, had had all taken on other projects as well. Um, me starting a business podcast, Joe starting a weightlifting specific podcast and Johnny starting a marketing company. And, uh, what we realized was like, man, we just, we need to find some bandwidth somewhere. And, uh, you know, and that's a podcast that you talk about reach. This was a hard decision for us to make, uh, primarily because we had such a, uh, audience that we developed. But when we look at what our goals are going forward, um, we felt like we could better serve people if we really isolated to the topics that we, we felt we had the best reach with. And, um, you know, it's a tough decision to make because at that point, you know, we were uh, anywhere between forty to 50,000 downloads a month. Um, and, and it's crazy when you look at the, the geographic effect of like how many countries people are actually listening to a podcast in. It's unbelievable. So I think the reach has been massive. And not only that, but like some of the people that I've had a chance to talk to are – for free, you know, and that what it would cost for me to, for an hour of, of their time to do consulting with, um, is, is, is crazy. And not only that, but just being able to meet some really high level people that I have a conversation with. And then in many cases, you know, we had a chance to connect with people and be able to reach out to them and see if there's other ways for us to, you know, be, be helpful and interact with them. Um, and, and that's been really cool, man. Just like be able to connect with people that are like-minded and, and learn from them. It's, it's almost as if, uh, yeah, it's a whole nother step in your education, right? Like the amount of information I learned just from the doc and jock podcast, having talked to all these different strength conditioning specialists, like my ability to relate to, to higher level strength coaches now and, and talk on the, on the level with, with them, um, is so much better than it was before just because we spent so much time talking to really, really um, smart people. And, and in the business podcast, you know, like that's just, that has been really helpful for me in a number of ways. Number one, um, I, I find that information to be a missing link in many ways in our profession to really establish ourselves um, in a, in a manner that is, uh, much more, uh, autonomous than in, in many cases we are right now. And, um, I think you have to do that through entrepreneurship and people coming directly to see you. But I also, it's funny when you start talking to people about things in your business and things that other people could do better. And a lot of the consulting calls we do in many, in many ways, I end up solving problems, um, that we've been dealing for a while just by listening to somebody else describe the way that they view something. Or so my business is actually improved dramatically just from me being able to delve into some of these topics with other people involved in, you know, entrepreneurial uh, ventures within physical therapy. Yeah, Danny, you bring up so many good points there. I, I mean, Brandon and I both, when we started this podcast, it, you know, it was because we didn't know which direction we wanted to head in education and, and healthcare. And we, we knew that we wanted to go one direction or another, but we weren't sure which one it was. And I think, like you said, the doors that have opened because of the podcasting and the people that we've gotten to talk to have shed so much light 
on on educational issues that we kind of felt you know were out there uh, it, it's been amazing and, and truly a learning experience for us i mean partially it's been selfish right I, i've wanted to learn more about this stuff so i go and i talk to an expert about it and uh you know it, it's really been helpful for me um, to kind of really get some clarity on which direction I think I may want to head in the healthcare field, uh, especially with regards to education. So I can definitely see how the, how the problem solving, the learning that comes along with podcasting is just so beneficial. Um, well, you know, not just that, but I mean, think, think about, uh, you know, realistically, how much more reach you have with, with, with some of these people that you're able to talk to, you know, and, and when I, um, when we first started, you know, we tell people we had a podcast, like my, uh, it wasn't really, I mean, they weren't as popular as they are now when we, whenever we, you know, three years ago started with a dog talk podcast, we told people we had a podcast and they're just like, what, some little, some little hobby that you do on the side or something like that. And like, no, let me take this, this take this shit seriously now. And like, now when you tell people we have a podcast, it's like so much more of a accepted, um, uh, you know, way to develop content and put that content out. So, um, I think it's growing significantly. I, I just, I, I'm, I love the idea of being able to have a conversation with somebody that you would want to talk to anyway, and then put it out there for other people to learn from. Like, how awesome is that? How, how much are we able to accelerate other people's, um, you know, progression in whatever topic it is that they want to learn? And if you don't listen to podcasts, I have no idea why you do that. Just, there's so much you're, you can learn. Like, you're just, you're squandering opportunity to progress yourself every day in any sort of, uh, information that you might want to improve on. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, voice is definitely becoming a, a hot trend nowadays, but um, I want to take it back to one of the older methods of learning. Uh, Danny, what are some of the books that you've read that you feel really made a difference either for you um, in, in either the healthcare clinician side of things or the business minded side, either or? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the the number one book that I give um, people, I tend to just give books away a lot, um, is the war of art by Stephen Pressfield. Um, and that book it has, I probably reread that book every, um, every year, at least once. And it's, if you haven't read it, go read it. It's super short. Stephen Pressfield is the guy that wrote, um, uh, Legend of Bagger Vance and uh, Gates of Fire, the uh, the movie that they based 300 on. Like he he writes a lot of like kind of war uh, fiction books and uh, in particular, but uh, he wrote a, a series of books, uh, Becoming Pro and uh, the the War of Art, which are about this idea of um, fighting procrastination and doing the work you know you need to do and dealing with the discomfort of some of the things you have to do in order to progress. So um, that book has just been really impactful uh, on me. Um, I also honestly feel like every physical therapist that goes to school should um, should get the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I mean, that the information in that book is still so relevant. And, you know, this is something that was uh, I written, I believe in the forties and it's, it's, it's still just so impactful if you think about how to engage with people. Um, you know, it re really, really interesting. And, it, and one book that I've read recently that I thought was great was, was shoe dog. It was actually the, the Phil Knight, uh, story about how he started Nike. And if, if, if you're in business right now and you're listening to this and you're in that phase of, uh, struggle, what, uh, Seth Godin would call the dip, which is sort of this idea of like, when you first start anything, you have this kind of excitement that builds and you have all this energy and you're really, really, you know, gung ho on it. But eventually you hit a dip when reality sets in and then you have to do the work and that's where things get tough and that's where people give up. And if you can get past that, you have an exponential increase in whatever it is you're trying to do. And that's when you get out of the dip. Well, if you read this book, Shoe Dog, and you feel like you're in the dip, you'll realize that Nike almost went out of business like dozens of times, you know, and it, it's, it's one of the biggest companies in the world. And, uh, it, it just, you know, Phil, Phil Knight, the way he describes that is just so interesting. And I, I know I, I couldn't stop, uh, um, you know, digesting that book. So so uh, I would recommend, um, you know, all of those. I definitely am going to sway more towards the kind of business side of things. I think you can learn as much as you want about physical therapy techniques, um, but the better you can get at uh, working with people and understanding how to listen and, um, and, and actually deal with human beings, uh, it, it makes the techniques that you learn less 
uh, necessary. Not to say that you don't need to be a good practitioner. You definitely do. But the best practitioners I know are the ones that engage with people uh, at, at a different level than superficial. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point, especially the fact that, you know, clinical excellence is all great. But if we don't know how to market it, if we don't know how to understand that individual with a lot of things, it's really not going to hit its potential that it really could to really get the best benefit overall. So I, I definitely agree with you that there definitely does need to be a good amount of incorporation of that along with clinical excellence to kind of help overall get the best fight for the profession and a lot of other issues going forward. I think that's true. And totally. And Danny kind of, you know, you know, and helpful, that was very helpful for all the books and such. And we'll post those links in the um, podcast show notes for anyone who's interested. They can kind of check it out on the links through Amazon here. But, you know, Danny, we like to end each episode by asking all of our guests this final question. And the question is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, uh, whether that be DPT or other healthcare provider related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? You know, this is, this is an interesting question. Um, yeah, it's, I guess it sort of uh, it relates to what we were just talking about, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, things you can learn from from books. And, and uh, I really, I really feel like if we as a profession um, were trained in uh, sales training. Now this sounds, people will hear this and they're going to be like, sales training, what am I, cold calling people or selling a used car? Uh, no, man, sales training is your ability to understand what problem somebody has and how to position a solution to that problem correctly. And we have a lot of really, really low cost, effective solutions to problems. And physical therapists typically sell like shit. They suck. They're no good at it. They don't understand how to actually engage with people in a way that is going to make them want to make that dis uncomfortable decision of doing what we do, which doesn't feel good. Like we're in the business of, uh, not having instant gratification where it takes a long time to get what the response that you want. So, you know, if our PT students understood how to um, sell themselves and engage with people on a different level, a better level, uh, and I just call it sales training because that's the way that that anybody else would teach it in any other industry. Um, but if they understood how to sell themselves and sell a profession better, uh, we would have so much more business and be able to uh, really use our skill set. Which, if you look at the options that are out there, which what surgery, it's uh, unnecessary. Uh, procedures like injections or, um, you know, some of these like minor procedures, minor surgeries they talk about. It's, it's medicine, medicine that we know doesn't really do anything, but harms us internally. Uh, it, it's, it's nothing good versus, we you know, what we have is, is uh, something that it has no side effects. It's, it's positive. It's, it's people learning how to take care of themselves. And, um, you know, if, if we could be better at one thing, it would be understanding how to sell ourselves and sell solutions to problems to create, uh, people making changes and committing to making changes long term. Yeah, I think that's a great take on it, Danny. I mean, at the end of the day, selling is really just helping people make better, well-informed decisions, you know, and I, I, I think we need to, as therapists, get over that and, and realize that um, because it really is just make, we have so much time with our patients, you know, we, that's one of the benefits that we have in this healthcare field. And I, you know, we need to be able to take that time and utilize it into making good relationships, you know, using our knowledge to help educate people and really kind of get down to the fact that, hey, look, at the end of the day, physical therapy is a pretty good decision. It's a pretty good choice. At the very least, it's non-invasive, you know, and uh, to totally, man. I 100% agree with you. And I like to think of it as like, we call it uh, like assistant buyers. Like we tell our our staff when we when we do sales training, which we do every month, we talk about this. It's it's like, dude, you, you're, it's, imagine you're in the room as an assistant buyer. Like you're trying to help them make the right decision. You're not trying to push them to anything. It, what you're trying to do is be an advocate for them to actually finally have talked to somebody in a transparent way in healthcare that has, you know, our, we have a cash practice, right? So we're, we, we, we have no, I don't give, I don't care what the hell Edna tells me they're going to reimburse me for. I could care less because we're going to do what's best for that patient at that time based on our clinical expertise and what we feel is, is, uh, is, is relevant. And that's a nice place to be because I'm, I am now a, uh, you know, fully transparent 
healthcare provider with you. I can't tell you that everybody you go to see is going to make those same decisions. You know, I can't say if that surgeon you go to see is in debt up to his eyeballs because he has terrible spending habits. And that guy just has to do a couple more surgeries per month so he can meet his mortgage and send his kids to a private school they go to. I don't know, but that does exist. And we can't take any sort of healthcare provider and put them on a pedestal of like, ideally, that's the way it would work where they would make decisions solely based on the best, uh, you know, interest of the patient. But, you know, you and I both know that that does not necessarily exist in all cases. So if that person doesn't make the right decision to where, you know, we're able to help them, who knows what's going to happen to them down the line. And so we look at it as it's really, it's our way to help them uh, as an assistant buyer and really be able to make a decision about what's going to be helpful for them, but also the least invasive, least costly way for them to get the solution that they want. Yeah. Great points, Danny. Um, You know, I I can't thank you enough for your time and for coming on the show tonight. Um, You know, could you tell our audience a little bit about where they can find you online and on social media? Sure. Yeah. You know, if if your audience is interested in checking our practice out, it's called Athletes Potential. Uh, So you just athletespotential.com or you could just look it up. Um, You know, you could just type Danny Matei into Google and you'll come up with a bunch of different things via Mobility Wad or Athletes Potential. Um, if you're interested in the uh, the business podcast I have right now, it's called the PT Entrepreneur Podcast, uh, which is on iTunes. It's also housed on a personal brand site I have, which is just drdannymatei.com. It's spelled M-A-T-T-A uh, as the last name. And, uh, you know, uh, that's that's pretty much it. You can always hit me up on on social media, Instagram. It's just Danny Matei PT. Um, I try to get back to everybody, even my, you know, personal emails, Danny at athletespotential.com. If you have a question for me, um, please reach out to me. I get back to everybody that does send me an email. I take a lot of pride in the fact that that takes a long time, but it, it, I think it's, in, if you're willing to reach out to me, then it's, you know, I'm definitely willing to take the time to, to uh, respond to you and, and answer whatever questions you might have and see if we can help you in any way. You know, it's fun to chat. Uh, it's, it's always fun to be on the opposite side of the podcast instead of, uh, actually having to ask questions <laughs> <Yeah>. and, uh, <laughs> and record. It's nice to just be able to, you know, tell you what you think. Thank you for attending class today. And we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, healthcareeducationtransformationpodcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.